there is power in your name. Thank you that we can use your name, Jesus. Lord, I pray that we would realize the power that you have. That we would allow your power to flow through us, God. We call upon your name right now. We call upon you, Jesus. And we need that filling of your Holy Spirit, God. And we can't do anything without you. We can't even worship you without you, God. So we just ask that you fill us right now. Let us pray. And I encourage your people right now to call upon your name. Maybe we're going through some hard things right now and we need you, God. Or maybe we're going through the best time of our life and we still need you, Father. And I pray that we never forget that. So let your hearts cry out to him right now. better it's good to be back i tell you i took a little took a little hiatus or whatever you call it i don't know i've never done it before but uh, a little uh, break and i just want to thank you guys how many know uh, morgan and uh and kevin did a great job amen can you say thank you thanks mo thanks kevin 
And uh, it's good to have uh, people that know the Word. So anyway, I'm going to jump right in. Uh, Revelation chapter 20, or sorry, chapter 20, chapter 3, verse 20. And uh, pray for me if I remember how to preach. And uh, I'm also nervous because I'm preached for a while. I'm, pray- I'm, I'm scared I'm going to preach uh, maybe two or three hours. So just pray that I do an hour. So anyways, yeah, anyway. But the title of today's message is, is, is the door of your heart opened? Is the door of your heart open? Last month we started our study about the church of Laodicea. And Laodicea, as you know, is kind of the apostate church. It's a church that's one of the last churches of the seven churches we've been studying in chapters, Revelation chapter 2 and 3. And it is an apostate church. And the word apostasy means a willful departure from the truth. Uh, now, some people's theology argue, can you, you know, saved, once saved, always saved, can you lose your salvation? We're not going to argue that, but all it means is, one of the definitions I like is that it means like a, a soldier rebelling against his commanding officer, and that's what this church was. It, how many know there's a lot of churches doing this out there today <clears throat> that are apostate, that are doing things their way rather than God's way shown to us through the Word of God? So the church of Laodicea represents an apostate church. The church at Laodicea was neither cold, which is openly rejecting Jesus, or hot, which is being filled with spiritual zeal and passion for God. And hear this. Remember a couple verses earlier, he said what? I wish you either hot or cold, but since you're lukewarm, I what? Spit you out. And isn't it sad? I set you guys up, if you remember, a couple weeks ago, probably a month ago, and I said, how many of you are red hot for Jesus? Remember that? And like one or two of you, I think Raymond, right? One or two raised their hands. But then I said, how many of you are cold? How many of you are just dead? You're, just, you're, not, you're here because your spouse makes you. No one hardly raised. I think one time I've had someone raise their hand. But most of you, I said, how many of you are just, you're not too hot, you're not too cold, you're just in the middle? Guess what that's called? Lukewarm. So isn't it weird that you and I make Jesus want to throw up? You don't miss me now, do you? <laughs> you're like, I want Morgan, I want Kevin back, you know. Anyway. But there it is, and that's where most of us are, right? But he's saying that I wish you either one or the other because if you're cold, then you know you've got to turn to God. But if you're lukewarm, you're not too hot, you're not too cold, and you're just kind of, you're, you're, it's like we say, you have too much of the world to be happy in Christ, you have too much of Christ to be really happy in the world. So you're kind of this miserable Christian. Instead, the members of Laodicea were lukewarm. They were hypocrites professing to know Christ, but not truly living for him. And I don't know about you, but I hate hypocrites. And how many know it's easier for me to see when you're a hypocrite? But it's really hard for me to see when I'm a hypocrite. But I, I'm learning to hate the hypocrisy in my life. Can anyone say an amen to that? And, and I want to be sincere. In 2019, I want to be a sincere Christian. I want to be a real Christian, a true Christian who really loves God. Not that we're ever going to be perfect this side of heaven. But how many know, as the Bible says, be Jesus says, be perfect as your heavenly Father. And as I'm told in the Greek, it means be becoming perfect. How many know I should be more like Jesus today than I was yesterday? That's the goal, and that's what we want to do. So let's pray and ask God to speak to us. Father, thank you so much for this time. It's so good to be back. And uh, I just love your word, and I love your people. And I pray, Lord, that uh, you would speak to them through me. I pray that you would anoint me, Lord. I am weak. Without you, I can do nothing. But with you, I can do all things. So God, I commit myself to you. I surrender to you. And I ask that you would use me as a vessel to speak to and through. And I pray, Father, for every ear, for every heart in this place, that you would open their ears and open their hearts to you, Lord. That we would respond to your word. We wouldn't just be hearers of your word. But we'd be, as James said, effectual doers. Let us be people this year who don't put on a spiritual show or act or have a form of godliness, but really live for you, really want to yield our lives to you, really want to be your servants. And Lord, in this day and age, a servant is not a popular word, but Lord, that's what your word says, that you are the master and we are the servants. So God, let us surrender to you. Let us be those bond servants, those love slaves, slaves by choice, not by fear or brutality, but because you are so good, we just say, Lord, all I can do is yield. All, all I have to give to you is my life. Let that be every heart in this place and every heart that's out in the foyer and on the radio or on the internet. Lord, speak to us. Change us. Let us be sincere people with hearts that are open to you. 
in Jesus' name. And everyone agreed, said? Amen. Can you do a little louder, amen? Amen. Amen, amen. like that. Amen. All right. Here we go. All right. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone, This is now Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Verse 21. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Verse 22. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen the picture, the classic picture of Holman Hunt. You got that picture? Holman Hunt? You seen that picture? Whoa, that's trippy. Okay, yeah, there you go. Holman Hunt. And you see that Jesus is knocking at the door, and this, is, this picture was, uh, is in St. Paul's Cathedral in London, England. And if you look at that door, upon first unveiling, it is said that a certain critic said to the artist, you made a great mistake. There's no handle in the door. And the artist, Holman, said it, the, it, that was intentional. The artist said, because the door opens only from the inside. I mean, that's good. Now, I'll tell you this. You know, if, if this story is true, I read it, Holman Hunt was right, for it's up to you and me to let the Lord o- into our lives. Now, hear this. You know, there's some, you know, I always talk about Calvinism and Arminianism, and some of you go, I don't care about any ism. But how many know there's extreme Calvinists that will say that God dragged me into the kingdom kicking and screaming? How many know that's not God? That's rape, right? If I, if I grab my wife by the hair and I say, you will marry me and you must, that, that's forced love, that's not love. How many know God woos us? Amen? Amen? God knocks and says, come, but you and I have to willingly open the door. And that's what he's saying here. So he's saying, there's no handle. Jesus is not going to kick the door down. Jesus is not going to force the door open. Jesus is going to woo you, draw you, and we you and I have to decide, are we going to open our lives and our hearts to God? As I said, he won't kick the door down. He won't force his way into our hearts. Yet although we use this verse to call people to sinners to salvation, how many people use this verse for individual salvation? You know, Jesus stands at the door and knocks. How many know we use a lot of verses out of context? How many know that? This verse is talking to Christians, to the Laodicean Christians. Now we can use it for non-Christians, but it's really not for this text. The, the context is for, for Christians. That are, that are lukewarm. And so hear that. It was actually written to a self-satisfied congregation in Laodicea that was doing church their way instead of God's way. And how many know that? I love what my pastor say, Pastor John. He says the difference between a relationship with Christ is doing things the way God wants it. How many know that? But religion is man's attempt to seek God. How many know I don't want to be religious? I don't want to seek God my way. I want to seek God his way. How many know? It says the Father searches. He seeks those who are what? Worship him in spirit and in, and in truth. His word is truth. Amen? But how do we, as, as Morgan said, we can't even worship the Lord without his spirit. Amen? Because it's his spirit that what? Leads us into all truth. It's his spirit that draws us. It's his spirit that, that, that reveals Christ to us. The Bible says no one comes to the Father unless the Father draws them. So we can't even come to God without God. Amen. How many know that? And I love when people say, you know, that, that's where I disagree with the Arminius. The Arminius believe there's something good in us to seek God, yet the Word of God says no one seeks God, no, not one. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Can anyone say amen to that? The only reason I know Jesus is because Jesus opened my eyes to the goodness of who he is. Amen. And yet I had to respond. He didn't go the Calvinist way and force it and say, you will be mine, I need you. God doesn't need me. He wants me. He loves you, he wants you, but he knocks. And how many know, I believe the scripture, when it says, um, it says many are called, but few are chosen, I believe, it, what a way I would say it is many are called, but few choose to respond to the call. Because how many know it's a cost to follow Jesus? Anyone notice that? You know, it's real popular to be a Christian today, really be a, a Bible-believing Christian, isn't it? Now, if you're a Laodicean Christian, yay, everyone loves you, but you want to really live for Jesus? I just dealt with that with my family. I mean, no, my family has received Jesus in this church like three or four times, but what they believe is Jesus is a way, one of many ways, and it's just our American way, and it's not the only way. But how many know the Bible teaches different, doesn't it? 
The Bible teaches John 14, 6, that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. How many know you say that at U of A, and you'll be lucky if you get out alive? Amen? Amen. Because that is not open-minded. And isn't it funny? I love this. Can I just say this? I'm going to roll here. But isn't it amazing how they talk about tolerance? They, They talk about diversity. And yet, They won't tolerate our diversity or our difference. They want to indoctrinate us. I told that to my liberal family. I said, you know why we, you know, you said we cling to our Bibles and guns. You know why we do that? Because you're trying to indoctrinate us. Instead of being tolerant, which means agree to disagree. I mean, I wouldn't have to tolerate you if I agree with you, right? But but tolerance means I disagree with you, but I yet respect your right to be dumb. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just making sure you're listening. But I respect your right to be wrong. I respect you. And you respect me, right? Right, right. But yet they'll say, no, if you believe what the Bible says about homosexuality, you are a bigot and you need to be shot. But we need to say, no, you know, as long as I'm not hurting homosexuals, I should be able to say what the Bible says about that lifestyle, shouldn't I? Shouldn't I have the right to say that? But they'll say, no, you don't. And and, and does anyone know Ben Shapiro? You ever heard of Ben Shapiro? He spoke at a Calvary and he said some scary stuff a couple months ago. But he was saying that California, you know, what happens in California, what happens in New York spreads to our country about three or four years. He's saying that California is getting so liberal that they're trying, they're already controlling all the schools, you know, teaching transgenderism in first grade, teaching sexuality in first grade. He says, what does a first grader need to know about sex? But that they're doing that. And so they've got the schools, the public schools, but now they're going after the Christian schools. Because they want to say that if you don't, if you teach against this lifestyle and, and transgender and all the isms, then we're going to take away your 5.13c. And he says they know that any true Christian is going to choose God rather than their money. So what's going to happen? They're going to have to stop having Christian schools. And then he says after that, their next agenda is, and, he, and he's very well researched if you study him, he says the next agenda is to stop homeschooling. Because guess what? They want to stop the Christian worldview. Does that concern you like it does me? That's what, and he says, and he says, I don't know if you remember, it was R, I think, 28. Remember the bill that I told you about last year that it was saying how they wanted to say any books or literature that that says, uh, I forget what it's called, um, conversion therapy, trying to get a homosexual to be a a straight person, that that is evil. Remember that? Do you remember that? Does anyone, does anyone? (laughs) Does anyone read anything? No, but but yeah, that was a bill, and it almost passed. And you know what Ben Shapiro said? He says, do you realize, do you know any book that believes in conversion therapy? He says, that means if that had passed, they would be able to fight that the Bible cannot be sold in California. Now, if you want to go, everything is awesome, everything is cool when you're part of being blind. No, I mean, there's some crazy stuff going out there. And we have to pray, and we have to stand up. And as I said, one pastor said it well. I think it was David Jeremiah. They're trying to push us into the closet but as they're coming out of the closet. But guess what, Christian? You need to stand up and speak the truth. What? In love. Amen? Yeah, clap it up for Jesus. And how many know churches like Laodicea would say, oh, we, we embrace everyone. We love everything. We love everybody. And how many of those churches are exploding in America? But churches like this, guess what? You see people go, hmm? You know, no, I don't want to believe what uh, the whole counsel of God. And I love what people say. They won't say they disagree with the Bible. They'll say, that's your interpretation. Yeah. And I'll say, well, show me the different interpretation. They never do. But anyway, I better move on. Okay, so there it is. Now, Jesus is talking to people who are meeting in his name, who are supposed to be Christians, but he's saying he's on the outside of the church and wants to come in. Wow, can you imagine that? Isn't that wild? Jesus is on the marquee of these churches. He's in the bulletin. He sang about, but he's on the outside. How sad to throw a party for Jesus and he's not welcome. I mean, you just can't even fathom it, can you? That Jesus is going, hello, it's supposed to be my church. Can I come in? No, we don't want you. We just want to talk about you. We want to just celebrate the Jesus we've made you into. But how many know, Jesus also, let me say this, he'll not come into a heart that won't welcome him as Lord. Amen? Amen? And that's what limits. Like, if you have issues with Jesus, guess what? When you argue with God, guess who's wrong? You are. 
And you can argue, but guess what? You need to eventually yield if you really want him to be in your life because he believes he's God. He really does. And he believes that you should submit and we should submit and we should yield to him and say, you know what, God, I, I, I surrender. Well, how does one get to the point where the Lord is on the outside of their church? How does a church get to a place where it thinks it's doing fine, but it's spiritually bankrupt? As I've told you many times, you know, uh, Matthew 7.21, it's not in the notes, but Matthew 7.21 says what? It says those, these Christians, supposed Christians will say, Lord, did we prophesy in your name? Did we heal in your name? Did we cast out demons in your name? And they'll say what? Depart from me. I never knew you. Hear this. I've been a Christian for 37 years. I've been in the ministry almost 37 years. I've never met anyone who says, that's me. That's me. So do you hear me? That means there's a lot of people that are going to die thinking they're Christians and are going to possibly hear depart from an enemy. How sad is that? So that's why this message is good. Even if it's hard, it's a good message for us because guess what? Even if this message makes you feel bad, you can always repent as long as there's breath in your lungs. Amen? Amen. So I want to encourage you. If this hurts you, if it wounds you, you know, they say if you throw a pat rock in the pack of dogs, the one that yelps the one that got hit. If you're yelping right now, then this is good so you can repent. Amen? Again, I hope you love me. I hope you're glad I'm back. <laughs> but anyway, and if this happened to the Laodicean church, can it happen to us? Well, the answer is what? Yes. Yes, it, and I think it does happen to us. Well, Scripture is the best interpreter of Scripture. Now turn with me to the Song of Songs or Song of Solomon. And some of you are going, where is that? Well, open your Bible to the middle, and you'll get to the Psalms. And then turn to the right, and you'll get to Proverbs, and you'll get to Ecclesiastes, and then you'll get to Song of Solomon, or Song of Songs, depending on your version. Turn with me, if you would, there. And we're going to be in chapter 2, verse 10. <clears throat> but this is a story of a king who has a bride, who's a bridegroom and is in love with a new bride. She's in love with a bride that was just sort of a common girl. She was out in the fields and he sees her and he sees this common girl who's, you know, no one has real value in her and he sees her and the king has great value in her. Do you see the picture of us and the bridegroom? How many know no one really valued you that much? Because that's why you realize you need a savior, man. You realize this world's rough. Uh, my life's rough and you realize I need a savior. And how many know he is? So it's a picture. I love this D.L. Moody Two of my favorite people, Dale Moody and Charles Spurgeon, said that this is their favorite book. And this book's really intense. If you've read this book, it's intense. It's not for young kids. So, you, so trend, close your ears. Just kidding. But they say this is a love story. And some people say it's just, it's just a, you know, a kind of poetic romance. But really, Spurgeon and Dale Moody believe, believed it was a love affair between us and Jesus. And how many know that's good? Especially if you're a Laodicean, especially if you're struggling, just kind of going through the motions. How many know you got to get back? Is that song, You've Lost That Loving Feeling? Remember, I had a sermon called that. We need to get back to that loving feeling. We need to get back to not just going through the motions, but really having a heart for Christ. And here it is. So, Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 10. My lover said to me, Rise up, my beloved, my fair one, and come away. And this is the bridegroom saying to the bride, Verse 11, for the winter is past and the rain is over and gone. The flowers are springing up and the time of singing birds has come. Even the cooing of turtle doves, verse 13, the fig trees are budding, the grapevines are in blossom. How delicious they smell. Yes, spring is here. Arise, hear that, arise, so she's slumbering. Arise, my beloved, my fair one, and come away. Verse 14, my dove is hiding behind some rocks, behind an outcrop on the cliff. Let me see you. Let me hear your voice, for your voice is pleasant. Isn't that neat that our voice is pleasant to the Lord? And you are lovely. Verse 15. Now hear the switch here in verse 15. Quick. And we say this verse a lot, but we don't use it in context a lot. Catch all the little foxes before they ruin the vineyard of your love, for the grapevines are all in blossom. Hear this. We always look, especially in our marriage, special relationship, we look for big things to come and hit us, right? We look for the big oxen going to trample our grapevines or the big wolf or whatever. But a lot of times we can overlook the little foxes, the little things. 
You know, they say in divorce, they say it's the little things that add up, the way you put the toothpaste cap on, or I don't know if you put, maybe you don't put it on, or the way you do the toilet paper. I know I always think it's weird when people put it backwards, you know, instead of coming over. It just, to me, it's like, where were you, how, how is that normal? But yet to some people, that's normal to just go backwards. And, you know, but, you know, those little things that we say, oh, that's silly, but those things add up. And what he's saying is that these little, the, the foxes would get through the cracks or they dig under the, the gate or the fence and they would eat the little uh, blossoms of grapes before they had a chance to grow. And how many know, do you know this? If you're married, do you know there's an enemy that wants to destroy your marriage? That little things, just, do you, have you know, has anyone noticed that? And so you need to be careful, not just the big things, you need to be careful of the big things, but be careful of the little foxes that want to spoil your love with your relation with God. So he says, the bridegroom says, come away with me, says the bridegroom. Run, uh, the rain has stopped, the bride, the birds are singing, I want to hear your voice, I long to see your countenance. Isn't that amazing that God wants to see us? <laughs> I don't even like to talk to me half the time. You know, but God wants to hang out with you and I. Isn't that amazing? The, the creator of the universe desires you. Now, if you feel, oh, nobody loves me, nobody cares, I'm worthless, God wants to talk with you every minute of every day. Has anyone here talked to God and got, hold on one moment, I'm running the, the universe, I'm kind of busy. I've never been on hold for God, have you? I've never said, hey, dude, I'm busy. I got bigger things than your little problem, right? God is always wanting to talk. Isn't that amazing? That God can do that. He can meet all the needs of every human of 7 billion people. It's pretty amazing. And run the universe. But watch out for the little foxes, the subtle little temptations that could hinder our love. And we're going to look today at what are some of those temptations that hinder our love. After hearing his invitation and warning, now the bride responds. Here's what the bride says, chapter 2, verse 16. My lover is mine. That's what we say. Don't we all say, I love Jesus. Don't we worship? I love Jesus. Don't we say that? Amen? Yeah. We all, I love you. My lover is mine, and I am his. He feeds among the lilies before the dawn. Hear that dawn, early morning. Before the dawn comes and the shadows flee away, he says, she says, then come back to me, my love. So she's saying, oh, it's a little early right now, so you go play in the mountains. You go do your own thing. Come back to me, my love. Come back a little later. Run like a gazelle, quickly come back, and, or a young stag on the rugged mountains. Here the bridegroom is outside the door saying, honey, come on, it's a glorious day, it's a glorious morning, I want to take you to new heights, I want, to hear wonder, I want you to hear wonderful songs that I'm going to sing to you, so be on guard against the little foxes of what, and what does the bride say? She says this, it's too early. You go play on the hills, and I'll catch up with you later. <sighs> Sound like anybody you know? Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it funny how we'll stay out late for stupid stuff, and we'll watch TV too late, but when it comes to quiet time, all of a sudden we're the most healthy people, right? You know, Lord, this is the cold and flu season. I need my rest. Yeah. Yeah. Right? If the Lord wakes you up, come on, pray. Seek me this morning. Oh, Lord, you know, I, I mean, I need my rest, Right? Isn't it amazing how your flesh just coddles you? Oh, precious, right? <laughs> Point number one, doctrinal drowsiness. We need to be careful of doctrinal drowsiness. I'm going to say this. This is why I get, if you sense I have an anger towards extreme Calvinism, I don't like any ism, but extreme Calvinism, because it believes once saved, always saves, and it believes if you pray a prayer, you're in like flame, you don't have to do a thing after that. But I love what Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon, who was a Calvinist, but I believe a balanced Calvinist, he said this, you can't have Christ truly in your heart without him changing it. Amen? Amen. Amen. And there's a lot of people who profess Christ where there's no change. But he says, if, and then Calvin said this, if you are set apart or chosen by God, then you are chosen to what? Be holy. But what happens? A lot of Calvinists say what? They say, I'm chosen, so therefore I can do whatever I want. Oh, no. And that's not right. I fight that, amen? So doctrinal drowsiness, because that kind of thinking can make you drowsy, can make you say, I can do whatever I want. Here's the response. Chapter 3 of Solomon, Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verse 1. By, 
By night on my bed, I sought the one I love. I sought him, the bridegroom, but I did not find him. Verse 2, I will arise now, I said, and go about the city, in the streets, and in the squares. I will seek the one I love. I sought him, here's the sad thing, but I did not find him. Can I say this real quick? How many remember when we went through our study of Henry Blackaby? Does anyone remember that? And he talks about experiencing God or hearing the voice of God. And he says this. A lot of people say, oh, I don't hear the voice of God anymore. Or I don't, I've never heard it. Or, but they'll say a lot of times, I don't hear the voice anymore. And he said a really interesting thing. He said that he goes, now think back. When's the last time you heard the voice of God? And usually if you've heard the voice of God, it's something he asked you to do and you didn't do. Now, how many of you as parents, when you ask your kid to do something and he doesn't do it, have you, do you get kind of mad and maybe say, you know, I'm not going to talk anymore about this? I love what Francis Chan said. I think Morgan quoted this. Francis Chan said this. He said, wouldn't it be neat if I tell my daughter to clean her room and she goes, and she, she, she goes away and all of a sudden she comes back like a day later and she goes, Dad, me and my friends got together and we studied what you said. We, we studied the Greek, we studied the context, we've done lots of commentaries on it, and we really understand what you said, clean your room. But she didn't clean her room. How many know that's us? Is it not? Oh, we're studying about cleaning room. We're not going to clean it, but we're studying it. How many know God doesn't want you to always study so much? He wants you to do when he asks you to do something, he really expects you and I to do it. Not to go, well, i got to pray about it. There's no pray about it as long as it's God. Now, if, he's, if you feel God asks you to do something that's against the word, then you know that's not God. Amen? But if he tells you to do something, love someone, forgive someone, you don't have to pray about that, do you? You just need to humble yourself and say, I'm going to be a doer. Amen? But he says this. This is back to Henry Blackaby. Henry Blackaby said this. The reason we don't hear the voice of God, because he spoke something to us and we said no. So he says, go back and see where you said no and then do what he asks. And guess what? You'll hear his voice again. Amen. Amen. Can anyone say yes to that? That's me. I realize that. Oh, my goodness. And there again, think about, I told you this, that a lot of times I'll say to my kids, I'll say, just obey me the first time. (laughs) Remember I told you I heard God laughing. (laughs) Oh, that's awesome. And he goes, I wish you were like that. Isn't it amazing we ask more for our kids than we give to our Heavenly Father? And you want to hear a verse for your parents that will make you feel really good? 2 Corinthians 6.10, I believe. It's not in my notes. But it says, once your obedience is complete, I will require the obedience of others. Hear what that's saying, parents? Saying you want your kids to respect you? You want your kids to listen to you? Then you need to listen to me. Amen? How many of us go, oh man, it's amazing my kids obey at all, <laughs> right? No, anyway, just kidding. And what happened here is that something that can happen to all of us corporately or to us individually, it's the danger of doctrinal drowsiness that says, Lord, I know you're calling me to come away this morning to seek you, but you know, Lord, I'm yours, you're mine. I'm robed in your righteousness. I'm sealed in the spirit I don't have to do anything. This is all works. I don't have to do it. My name, and see the doctrine. My doctrine says I don't have to do anything. I'm sealed. My name is written in your Lamb's Book of Life. Yawn. So I'll meet with you later. I'll catch you later, Lord. I love you. And as the day progresses and the trials of life arise, we start to cry, Lord, where are you? Like this one. Remember, she was seeking him. She couldn't find him. Lord, where are you? Hear this, guys. Where are you? He called you, and you and I said no. How many times have we done that? I'm going to ask you to raise your hands because I know you won't. But how many times? Be honest with yourself. The Lord draws me all the time, and I go, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm busy. Now, hear me. Think about if your kids said to you, Mom and Dad, just give me money and give me food. Just stay away. I'm doing my own thing. Would any of you be offended? I would. I am. <laughs> but yet God, who's perfect, asks us to do stuff. And how many know when he asks us, it's not a suggestion. It's not a thing. If you have time. How many, when God calls you, it's the right time. Amen? Yeah. And just like this bride, how often do we say, I don't sense the Lord. I don't sense the Lord anymore. 
as my day, my day it feels empty, my night is dark, where is God? Well, the answer is, when he called us, we chose to say, I don't need you. Now, we don't say that out loud because that would be too brutal, but guess what? Whenever we're going, thank you, but I can't, Lord, we're saying no. Amen? And isn't it funny how we'll say that, like, we need to have date nights with our spouses, we need to make special times, we need to keep the romance up, but isn't it weird that we don't think we need to do that with God? And yet he's the bridegroom, we're the bride. We, just as we need to work on our physical marriages, our marriages with our spouses, we need to work on our relationship with Jesus. We say things like this, I don't need to go to Bible study. I don't need devotions this morning. I don't need to go to church regularly. How many know, I told you, church attendance is all time low. Because people say what? That's legalism. I have a personal relationship with Jesus. How many know Jesus, through Hebrews, commands you, do not forsake the fellowship with other believers as a custom of some, especially what? As the day of the Lord approaches, especially in the last days. That proves we're in the last days. We say, I don't need to do it. But yet I've told you stats, secular statistics, the government, I was reading a government statistic that says if you go to church regularly, if you, meaning like only miss for vacation, only miss like maybe two, three times a year, your chance of divorce goes from 50% failure, half of all marriages fail, even in church. It goes to only an 15% failure. How many want that? You stay in church, you come to church regularly, your chance of divorce goes from 50% to only a 15%. How many like those stats? And that's government statistics. That's not a Christian statistic. But we'll say, you know, I don't need to expend the energy because I'm his and he is mine. I'm secure in Christ. And as the story unfolds, we'll see that as the bride seeks her bridegroom, as she does indeed, she eventually finds him. But hear this, guys. It takes energy. Amen? Amen. It takes effort. And anyone who tells you it doesn't is lying to you. That's like saying that a marriage doesn't take energy. Anyone want to say that to me? Oh, we're just so in love. We just, just everything just exudes. Well, that's great for a year and a half. I know all marriages usually last about a, six months to a year and a half because that's all the, oh, that's all the tinglies, oh, right? But after seven, eight, ten years, then guess what? It starts to become real love. Because when I wake up and my hair is going like this and my breath is like the breath of death, my wife is going, I just feel so in love with him. She's looking like Tim Hawkins. Remember Tim Hawkins? What is that, Lord? Why? You know, I mean, how do you know? I always tell you this. When we got married, everyone said that we were about the same age. People say, what, were you like a year older? Right? So when we first got married, we've been married now 20, oh, come on, 24 years. We, what are you, about a year older? Now people say after service, they'll go to my wife, they'll go, your dad did such a great job. <laughs> so, you know, my wife has got the poor, she's got the short of the stick. I mean, you know, I mean, I've, I've got the beautiful wife that looks like my daughter. She's got the old man. You know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know I look like a cradle robber, you know. But anyways, I don't know what that was for, but anyway, I'm just saying is, and this is what I say. You know, I, I always say this whenever I do weddings, which I don't do a whole lot. I don't like weddings. But anyways, there's a lot of stress. But here's what I say. Today you love your wife or your husband the least you'll love him ever. How many love really grows when you're 20, 30 years in? Because then it isn't all about the feelings. Then it's about real love. It's about endurance. It's about you learn the word, you learn the word forbearance. Right? You wives know what I'm talking about. Forbearance. Why is he so dumb? You know what I mean? It's like, and he's a pastor. You know, anyway. Anyway. But it takes energy. It takes effort. Men, think about this. If only we would pursue God the way we pursued our wives. Amen? Only way, if you women would pursue God the way you pursued your husband, like, oh, uh, you know, and just kind of, you know, oh, oh, you're so smart, oh, oh, liars. But anyways, you know, I mean, if only we would do that. I'm not saying lie to God, but you know what I'm saying. You worked it, some of you women. You know what I'm talking about, right? Oh, I dropped my pencil. Oh, you know what I mean? You know what I'm talking about. (laughs) Sorry, that was wrong. That was wrong. I'm sorry. Yeah. 
you got to edit that out right there. But anyways. <laughs> Jeremiah 29, 13 says this, you shall seek me and find me when you search me. Here's the clause that we don't like. With all of your heart. You got to do it. If you're saying, man, I'm not finding God, then God's going to ask you, are you, then I'll ask you, are you searching, him with all, are you searching for him with all your heart? Because he promises if you'll do that, he'll, you'll find him. If you search for him half-heartedly, good luck. If you search for him that he's a way, good luck. If you search for him, well, I want you to be Lord in this area, but not this area. God kind of wants to be Lord of all. Not kind of, he does. I'm being facetious. Guys, there's no room for laziness. There's no room for apathy in our relationship with the Lord. But now some of you might say, Pastor Craig, but I'm saved. Yes, you might be. The Lord, you can say, the Lord is mine and I'm his. That's true. But pastor, can I just hear this? Some people say, pastor, can I just be at rest? Can I just be at peace? Why does it have to be such work? Can I just rest in the finished work of the cross? Absolutely, you can. But watch out for the dangers. Watch out for the danger of doctrinal drowsiness that keeps you from responding when the Lord pulls you and calls you and he pulls on the strings of your heart during the lunch hour and says, come away with me, my beloved. There are mountains I want to show you. There are new songs I want to sing with you. I want to share with you. I want to share my love with you. You see, the Lord comes to us constantly saying, drop what you're doing and take five minutes to talk with me Take 10 minutes to worship me. Take 15 minutes to pour out your heart, your concerns of the day to me. And as I said, how many know God will never ask you to be irresponsible? He won't ask you in the middle of a board meeting to drop to your knees and in the middle of a presentation and say, sorry, the Lord told me I need to seek him right now. How many know God does things decently in order? Amen? He's going to ask you to seek him at an appropriate time. Now, six in the morning for some of you might not be an appropriate time but he will call you when you have time, amen? Hang gliders understand this. They, when they get a report that the thermals are perfect, dude, right? When they hang gliders that in Jackson Hole, I, I go to Jackson, I used to live in Jackson, and uh, people hang glide off this mountain in town, and, and so when the thermals, when the thermal report is perfect, they don't say, I can't go today, but maybe tomorrow I, if I can fit it in, because there's no guarantee that the winds will blow the same way tomorrow, as they're doing today. And the avid hang gliders move when the wind is blowing. How many know this? The Holy Spirit is like, what does it say in the Bible in John? He's like the wind. You don't know where he comes or where he goes. How many know when God blows and says, hey, come and draws you, how many know he wants you to draw, to come? He's not suggesting. How many know the Bible says today is the day of salvation? How many know this? Hear this, guys. I want to say this, and I hope this scares you in a good way. But how many know people say to me, I used to have a radio show, I have a radio show now, but I used to have a live talk radio show, and people would come to me or call and say, um, I feel like I've blasphemed the Holy Spirit. And I would always say to them right away, I said, no, you haven't. And they go, how do you know? You haven't heard my story yet. I go, no, you haven't. And they go, how do you know? And I said, because you wouldn't be worried about blaspheming the Holy Spirit if you blasphemed the Holy Spirit. How many know, as I said, no one comes to Father unless the Father draws him. The Holy Spirit draws every man, every woman to himself. So if you are still worried about not responding, then you're being drawn. Amen? It's the day when you don't feel the draw anymore. It's the day when you're fine. You say, I don't care. That's when you need to worry. Does that make sense to you? But how many know this? Blasphemy Holy Spirit is only God can make this judgment when he draws someone and draws someone. and draws. I believe he draws everyone. That's my opinion. Then no one, because it says in Romans 1, that none will be with excuse. No one will say, God, I didn't know. You didn't draw me. I don't know. But he draws and he draws. And we say, no, 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 no. And eventually, God in his all knowledge will go, okay, I'll stop drawing you. How many know that's scary? That's why I believe the Bible says today is the day of salvation. If you feel the Spirit drawing you, respond today. Don't put it off because it might not draw you tomorrow. Got quiet there. But the wind blows the same. They don't know if the wind's going to be good tomorrow. But thanks for your invitation, the hang glider might say. I can't go this week, but next week I'll go. Why? Because there's no guarantee, as I said, that the winds, that they'll find the following week, the wind's as good as this week. And the same is true in our spiritual lives. When the thermals of the Spirit or when the wave of the Holy Spirit is rolling in, we must respond immediately. 
immediately. I'll tell you, that's the key to being a godly man or woman. When the Spirit tells you to do something, do it. Every time when the Spirit says, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this story, and I haven't preached in a while, so give me some grace. I'm going to be a little long maybe. But hear this. I'll never forget it. Here I'm, I'm at Grace Chapel, and I'm saying, Lord, I'll do anything you want me to do today. And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm sitting there, and the Lord says, witness this guy. Well, this guy looks like Mike Tyson. And this guy is angry. And he's like, literally, he's like this. And the Lord says, witness to him. And I'm like, why do you want to kill me, Lord? You know, and, and, and I just so he's like sitting at this little bench around this, t- this uh, tree, this circular bench, you know, one of those tree benches. And so I just shark him. And I just keep walking around. And finally the guy says, you're supposed to share Jesus with me, aren't you? I'm like, I don't think I'm a prophet, but I kind of think that might be God. And I said, a matter of fact, you're not going to kill me for doing that, right? No. I said, a matter of fact, I, I felt like God said that. And he goes, I was just praying, Lord, I need to answer. If you can send someone, please send someone to me. Now, wouldn't it be neat if I just ran up to him and said, Lord, that would have been a lot better than dun, 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 the guy going, bonehead, you're supposed to share with me. I mean, you know. But every time I've responded, I've always seen a great adventure. But hear this, hear this. I was on my way to lunch and I was late. Imagine me being late. So I'm like, Lord, I'm late. I can't. And the Lord's like, you're always late. So just share with this guy. And guess what? It was awesome. And it was great. And I got, to, he, he, I got to lead him back to Christ. He was a boxer. And this church told him in town, if I told the name, you'd know it. But this church told him, you can't be a boxer and be a Christian. And I said, Paul talks about boxing. Paul went to boxing. Paul talks about wrestling. I said, are you working for the mafia or taking falls? And he says, no. And I said, so then there's nothing wrong with that. You can box as long as you do it honorably. Really? Really, really? You know? As long as you give me tickets if you're a big fighter or something. No, I'm just kidding. No, I say, you know, you can do it. Right? Anyway, that was all free. Anyway. Why does the Bible say, seek the Lord while he may be found? Because there's times where he will not be easily found. As I always say, and that's found in Isaiah 56, 55, verse 6. How many of this? It's hard to find Jesus in an emergency room when someone's dying. If you haven't been walking with God, how many know it's hard to find Jesus when you're dying? You can do it, but how many know it's a lot harder? But wouldn't it be better that you, if anything like that ever happened to us, we're ready because we've been walking with Jesus even in the, like Morgan said, worshiping in the hard times, but also worshiping what? In the good times. How many know that's when we get in trouble, isn't it? The good times, we say, thank you, God, I'll take it from here. And God goes, oh my, because he knows what's going to happen when you take it from here. We're going to and crash the car. You know? But some might say, but that's irresponsible, Craig. If I just respond to the Lord wherever I am, what about my obligations? What about my responsibilities to my family? What about my job responsibilities? Hear this. As I said, God is a God of order. He won't ask you to do something. He won't ask you to be a bad employee. He won't ask you to just blow off work all the time. He won't ask you to do that. But hear this. His call never conflicts with our work or what we really need to do. The problem is that at times we think we deserve to watch Fox News for two hours or to watch the Wildcat game for two or three hours or to look at YouTube videos for four hours. Or to, isn't that amazing how you can get on the internet and just all of a sudden you're like, what did I do with the whole night? Anyone? No, I'm the only sinner? Okay, thanks, liars. Anyways, but, or watch a movie for two and a half hours. For those are the times the Lord calls us to come away. Those are the times where God says, hey, put down the, the remote control and seek me. But we have a choice with what to do with our leisure time. And hear this, guys. I know some of you guys love your leisure time. I've been to your house and seen your 50, 150 inch screens. that are big as, big as that screen right there, you know? I've seen it, okay? It's funny. You guys go, I'm so poor. Don't buy a $20,000 TV. Okay, I'll tell you, I went to, it's funny, I went to Four Corners ministering the Indians and then the Navajo Nation, and I remember I went to this place with the Navajo, it was the head of the Navajo, it was a, uh, what do you call it, a, he was the, I forget what they call him, the shaman, he was the witch doctor, and he had this little hobagon, they're like a five-sided house, right, dirt floor, no water, um, and 
Yet in his house, he had a generator, a big screen TV, and a laser disc. This is years ago. And I'm like, man, us Americans have really blessed the Indians, haven't we? I mean, no, no, no running water, but they have a TV. I'm just going, oh my goodness, tell me devil is not real. But hear this, I want to say this. You know, we as Christians are supposed to muse. You know what muse means? Does anyone know what muse means? It means to think, right? Cults say, you know, just, you know, empty your mind. Just, right? We are supposed to meditate on Scripture. We're supposed to think. We're supposed to mull it over, kind of like a cow chewing its cud, where it kind of chews its cud, eats it, spits it back up, chews it again. I mean, I know that's gross, but you get the point. Think about the Scripture. Mull it over. Think about it. Think. So it's think. But hear this. What do we like to do as Americans? We like to go to amusement parks. We like to be amused. You know what amused means? The opposite. It means to what? Empty your mind. If you're not sure about this, ladies, I'll use you guys as an example, watch your husband watching TV. <laughs> not a whole lot of thinking going on there. And you women too, but you guys don't seem to get as enthralled as we do. It's something about that remote, we just go into a new land. A twilight zone. You know? And, and do you kind of see the enemy behind that? If I can't steal their salvation, I'll just distract them to where they'll just do stuff that's worthless. And you know, how many times you watch a movie and go, that was a waste of two hours? Yeah. Very rarely do you watch a movie and go, that was awesome. If you're godly, most movies you're like, wow, that had a weird agenda, didn't it? You ever see how the enemy has a little agenda, homosexual agenda, one world order, you know, everything, everyone's equal, all this weird stuff. I always love what my pastor, Pastor John, said. He says, when you watch a movie, always hear the sermon they're preaching in that movie. Because they don't spend 30, 40, 50, 100 billion dollars, or 100 million dollars, whatever it is now, billions, I don't know, without having a message. And we need to say, is that message we, is really, because guess what, that's how the enemy indoctrinates us. Right? We just hear it enough. We start to go, okay, we're like the frog in the water. Amen? If they just came out and said, Christians, stop believing the Bible. Believe this. we go, oh! But they just slowly put it through to where we go, everyone's doing it. I guess that's the new normal. Okay. Do you see how it works? You know the frog in the water, right? You, if you throw him in hot water, he'll just jump out. But if you slowly turn up, the frog won't notice it, and he'll just slowly be boiled, burned to death or boiled alive. I mean, a lot of us are getting boiled alive by what we watch and what we read and what we take in of this world. Second thing is spiritual self-centeredness. Spiritual self-centeredness, Song of Solomon, chapter five, verse two. He says, I slept, this is the bride talking, I slept but my heart was awake when I heard my lover knocking. Here it is again, you see how it correlates with if I stand at the door and knock, you know, Revelation 3.20, but he says, I'm knocking in Song of Solomon 5.2. Uh, my lover's knocking and calling, open to me. Notice he didn't ca- kick the door down. He says, open to me. So it's your free will. My treasure, my darling, my dove, my perfect one. My head is drenched with dew, my hair with the dampness of the night. The hair of the king of kings was full of dew because he came to enter a dark night of the human of human sin. How many know this? The Bible says the foxes, Jesus said the foxes have hold the birds have nests, but the Son of Man, what? Has nowhere to lay his head. Isn't that amazing how some of our televangelists live in these palaces and have these $250,000 cars and yet Jesus, who's the King of Kings, chose to sleep on the Mount of Olives a lot of times. Isn't that amazing? If anyone deserved to sit, sleep in a palace, it's Jesus, amen? But when Jesus came, he says he didn't come to be served, but to serve. He said, hey, my hair is damp with dew because I slept outside last night. Because you church didn't even welcome me in. You bride didn't welcome me in. I'm outside. But he came to enter and he came to serve a sinful world. He came to minister to those who are lost. Yet how does the bride respond to her bridegroom who came to sacrifice his life for her? Verse three of chapter five. But I responded, I have taken off my robe. Should I get dressed again? I have washed my feet. Should I get them soiled? Or we could say, but I went to church this once this month. How many times do I gotta go? It's rainy out, Lord. 
Amen? You know, it goes down when it rains. People go, it's raining. I lived in Oregon. It rains nine months out of the year. I went to church. Okay? I lived in Jackson where it's snowy and icy, and I went to church. Okay? So we can go to church. Verse 4, my lover tried to unlatch the door. So Jesus kind of says, hey, come on, let me in. And my heart thrilled within me. So the, this bride loves her, her, her bridegroom. And my hands drip with perfume. My fingers drip with lovely myrrh. As I pull back the bolt, verse 6, I open to my lover. But hear this, what? He was gone. So you hear, God kind of wants you to respond quickly. My heart sank. I searched for him, but I could not find him anywhere. I called him, but there was no reply. Here the bride, I'm perfumed, the bride says. My feet are washed. Why should I soil them again by opening the door to you? Do you hear that? I mean, that's not what a husband wants to hear, is it? Does a husband want to hear, honey, I just don't touch me. I got my, my, lips, my lipstick on. You're going to mess up my face. Stop. Isn't that what we see supermodels do? And it's like, whoa, that's weird. But that's kind of what this bride's doing. That's kind of sometimes it's conferring us. Now follow the analogy here, guys. Jesus came to seek and to save those who are lost. And without a home, his hair is full of dew. His hands are soiled from touching sinful humanity. Not because he's sinful, but because he ministered to sinful humanity. He gave everything. He bled. He died. He, knew, he who knew no sin became sin for us. But hear this, if we're not careful, however, like this bride, we can say, I don't want to soil my hands. I just want to be super spiritual. I just want to be mystical and religious, and I'm saying it in a very negative way. I just want to stand in the midst of, of some incense and candles and have a great spiritual form of godliness. And how many know that in 2 Timothy 3, 5, it says in the last days, what? That people have a form of godliness. They'll act religious, but deny the power thereof that could what? Change them. That means they won't yield to the Holy Spirit that can change them and make them Christ-like. And what does God say? What does Paul say? God through Paul say, which nobody heeds. He says what? From such people turn away. When you see someone who's religious, who professes Jesus, but is living like the devil, you're supposed to not condemn them. You're not supposed to judge them, but you should say, I can't be around that. Because why does it, what does it say in 1 Corinthians 15? Bad company corrupts good morals. We are who we hang out with. But these people don't really have a real sincere love for Jesus. It's too much work for them. Well, that's not where I am, says our bridegroom. My head is wet because I come to impact the world, this sinful world, to turn it right side up, to turn it back to me, to minister to it. So Jesus would say, forget all your clean hands and feet. There's practical, practical ministry to do. There are people that you need to touch for me. And I'm not saying go sin with people. Don't hear that. But I'm saying I mean, ministering to a non-Christian sometimes is a little messy, is it not? Sometimes it's a little work. Sometimes we've got to let God interrupt our day to say, minister to that person that looked like they wanted to kill me. But how many know when God tells you to do something, it's always good? But you're going to have to risk getting dirty. You're going to have to risk changing your, your plans. You're going to have to risk saying, you're the Lord, I'm not. I'm here to minister for you. It's not about me. In the last days, it says men will be what? Lovers of self rather than lovers of God. Lovers of pleasure and self rather than lovers of God. So this tragic self-centeredness to which we, the bride, are very vulnerable to, especially if we have been a bride for a while. Amen? It's easy to get caught up in that, oh, I'm good with Jesus. I don't have to, he knows I love him. Isn't that what, isn't that what husband and wife say? Oh, she, my wife knows I love her. She knows it. How many wives like to hear it once in a while, don't you? Do you ever get tired? Of it? That's the 797 time you told me you love me. Enough! I don't think my wife's ever said it to me. I think my wife's, really? Do you really do? Yes, I do, pooky, schmooky, schmooky. She goes, ugh, all right? Never, dude, I got it. I've never heard her say that. And if she does, then I'm in real trouble, amen? It's not about how we're doing, at least how we're looking spiritually. It's about how are we, how are we willing we are to get our feet dirty for the Lord and his work, and help open the doors so that others can come to know him. Hear this, guys. I want to say this. I've said this before. We want to be, how many know there's two seas in Galilee, or in Israel? There's the Dead Sea, and then they're, they're not really, well, the Dead Sea is kind of like a sea, but there's a Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. 
And how many know the Dead Sea? Why is it a Dead Sea? I think the average sea has, uh, I'm so bad with this, 3% salt to sea, but the Dead Sea has like 30% salt. You get salt water from the Dead Sea in your eye, your eye is dead. I mean, I got a drop in it. Pat Lazovich splashed me once, and I'm like, oh, and I punched him. Anyway, but didn't really. But anyways, it was just as brutal. But why is it? Because water from the Jordan goes into it, but nothing goes out. Do you get that? So it's constipated. It's just dead. How many of some of us spiritually are constipated? We just take in. Feed me. Feed me. Right? But we're supposed to be like the Sea of Galilee, taking in from the Jordan, right, and then giving out. And guess what? It's really a big lake, but it's fresh. It has fish. It has life in it. Because what? It takes in from the Lord, and then it gives it out. You get it? You want to be healthy in God? Take in on Sundays and then give it away. But if you just keep it in and go, I, you know, I'm just happy in my little cloistered church and just hiding out from the big bad world, you're gonna, maybe God's going to feel really distant to you. But you want to experience God? Take what you learn here and take it out into the highways and byways. That's what you're supposed to do. Amen? Because you can go places I can't go. I'm a little pastor stuck in this little church, right? You guys, remember, what is my job? To equip you, the saints, for the work of ministry, Ephesians 4.12, that you would go out and do the work of the ministry. No one said a lot of amen on that one. It's like, I pay you to do it, don't I? No. <laughs> now, later in the Song of Solomon, the bride runs out into the city and says, and I'm not going to have you turn there because I'm running out of time. He says, let me tell you, the bride, the bride says, let me tell you about this one whom my soul loves. And the same thing happens to you and I I'll be wondering where the Lord is and why I'm not sensing his presence when suddenly there's someone for me to tell about him. There's someone that I share with. And I'll tell you, whenever I share Jesus with somebody, how many know I feel close to God? Does anyone say amen to that? I always sense his presence. I always feel spirit. Because what? Because I'm taking in from the word, I'm taking in from church, and then I'm giving it out. And I sense his presence because that's what Jesus said he came to do. And if you're his disciple, you came to do the same thing. What? He came to seek and to save that which is lost. Not just to hide away. Now, I mean, no, we need that. We need to be built up in the church, but we need to then be built up to go out. Right? To get our feet dirty in this world, not sinfully, but to minister to sinful people like we are and were. Amen? Amen. And sure enough, as I talk to people about Jesus, I'll experience intimacy with Him. And guys, the key to intimacy in your Christian walk and the source of true spiritual energy and the ability to skip on the mountains with the Lord. Isn't that funny? Skip on the mountain with the Lord. I mean, you know, you brides kind of go, oh, that's so cute in a field. Oh, you know, guys, that's kind of weird, right? I just don't, I can't, it's hard for me to picture skipping with Jesus, but hey, you know, I'm cool with it. I'm open, right? But, uh, you know, but it, just skipping on the mountains of fellowship and, and the boldness to share Christ with your neighbor, it's to say yes to the bridegroom when he knocks on your door of your heart daily. You want to know Jesus in 2019? Not just know him, but know, feel his presence? Then say yes. Just respond to him. When, when he talks to you in worship about a sin, or talks to worship about say, doing, ministering to somebody, or talks to you about yielding something, do it. Write it down immediately and do it. How many know there's a lot of things if you think that God's told you to do that you've forgotten? I encourage you when you pray, when you read, have a pad and paper, write it down because I, mean, I can remember bad, dirty jokes I learned before Christ, right? I still have them in my head, 37 years. But my scriptures, I forget. God's will, I can easily forget. We have to write it down. I remember a pastor told me that, an old, this old wise pastor at Bible college said, Craig, if you want to be a good pastor, learn to write things down. He goes, you won't, but hopefully remember this when you're older. I'm older now. I wish I wrote. How many can say amen to that? I wish I write things down. I'm telling my son, write things down. My daughter, write things down. Because there's a ton of things that he's asked me to do that I've forgotten. All of a sudden I go, oh man. I want to close with this. I have 21 seconds. J. Vernon McGee says this. You remember J. Vernon? Beloved. He's the guy who said, you know, someone said, should women wear makeup? And he says, if the barn needs paint, paint it. <laughs> okay. That's my kind of guy right there. Anyways. Yeah, 
Here's what he says about Revelation 3.20. He says this. He says, I believe that we're in the period of the last two churches. Remember Philadelphia? Philadelphia was a church that was a good church. Philadelphia was a church of little strength, kind of like any church you know. And, but it held to the word. It, it loved Jesus. Its strength was God, not power, because it had powerful people. It was, the power was God. That's the church we want to be. I'm not saying we are that, but we want, we're working towards that. And then there's the Laodicean church that Jesus is on the outside knocking. There are a lot of churches today that are like the Laodicean church, which are moving farther and farther away from the Lord into apostasy. And there are also churches that are staying strong in the word of God. These churches are like the Philadelphia church. And hear this. The reason why I believe most churches are compromising, because it costs to teach the whole counsel of God. Because what did Paul say to Timothy? He says, be faithful, preach the word of God in season and out of season. How many? I believe this is a time where it's not in season to preach the whole counsel of God. It is not. You have to kind of adjust things. You have to pick. That's why I love Calvary's because we teach expositionally. You hear the whole counsel of God. You don't just hear my sermon, what I like to talk about. When we go through a book, you deal with stuff I don't even want to talk about. And how many know that's good? Because you get the whole counsel of God. As Paul said, I'd not shun to give you the whole counsel. This is a church which will be, hear this, the Philadelphia church will be raptured. How many of you want to be raptured? And you want to make sure you're going to a Philadelphia church. Other churches like the Laodicean church has tremendous organization. They're big, including all, they include all denominations. They get along with everyone, right? Because they're all inclusive. All those who profess to be Christian churches, but which have long since, hear this, departed from the word of God and his truth. And from the person, the personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And this is the great division that exists in the church today. One church will be raptured and the other will be left behind to go through the great tribulation. It was so funny. I had a person on my YouTube, I I haven't gotten a negative comment, but this person said, this church is false. It teaches the rapture lie. I said, I would like to talk to the guy. If you want to go through the tribulation, Maybe God will honor your will. But I'm going to tell you, it's going to be hard to live on this earth where you can't buy a cell without the mark. And as soon as you take the mark, you're, going to, uh, you're done. And there's 100-pound hailstones cracking through your roof. And a third of the earth is dying. And the sun is darkened. I don't want to be here. Now, it's not, I'm saying this because I'm just choosing to escape. How many of Jesus said, pray that you might be worthy to escape? How many of Jesus tells you to escape? You should want to escape. If you are masochist and you like torture, if you pray hard enough, maybe Jesus will say, okay, go through it. But this is the apostate church, the church that's willfully departed from Jesus, which professes to be a Christian but lacks the true spiritual reality and the fruit of Christ's spirit in their life. But even hear this, this is the key I want you to hear with, end with. But even to this church, this worldly church, Jesus issues a final loving call. Now hear that, it's his will what? 2 Peter 3, 9, that none may perish, but all might come to repentance. All might come to know him. He, the final loving call to repentance and an invitation to come back to himself, to come back to Jesus, so that they don't have to go through the pain of the great tribulation and ultimately hell. Do you hear that, church? And I want to say, would you get the lights? I want to say today, if that's you, and maybe this message convicted you, hear this. Remember, today is the day of salvation. Revelation 3.20 says, Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. If any man or woman will open the door of their heart, then I will come in and I will dine with them. I'll have fellowship with them. But here's the key. You have to open the door of your heart. You have to surrender your life to him and say, Jesus, I let you in, your Lord. And if you'll do that today, maybe you're here as a Christian, but maybe you've been like the Laodicean church. You just had a form of godliness. But today, Jesus is saying, come back to me and walk sincerely with me. Respond to the promptings of my Holy Spirit, my voice. But maybe you're here today and you've never, you've always had that fear of, I don't really know Jesus. I'm not sure if I was to die today, I would spend eternity with God. Then today, make sure and respond to Christ. Amen. Remember what the Bible says? Today is the day of salvation. Don't put it off. Don't say, I'll do it tomorrow. Because guess what? There might not be a tomorrow. Really. 
So today is the day. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes out of respect for the Lord? And I always ask, if that's you, if you want to respond to Christ for the first time or you want to recommit your life to say, I don't want to be a Laodicean Christian. I want to be a true, I want to be a Philadelphia Christian, one who really loves you. If that is you today, I want everyone, if you're doing great, pray for those that need to respond to Christ. Amen? But even if you're doing great, I want everyone, if you would, so no one feels left out, pray with me out loud so that nobody feels left out. And if you go, Craig, why do I have to pray? Because see it as a way you're learning how to lead others to Christ. Amen? So pray this prayer out loud with me if you would. Lord Jesus, I confess you I'm a sinner. Please forgive me my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I confess you with my mouth and I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. Thank you for receiving me for the first time or thank you for receiving me back. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and empower me to live for you all the days of my life. Help me to respond to your voice and to obey you because you are a good bridegroom. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give the Lord a clap if you played that prayer. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, Jesus said this, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father in heaven when he comes in glory with all his heavenly angels. Hear this, I'm not gonna call you forward like I used to be a good Baptist. I'd make you come forward. But hear this, if you prayed that prayer to receive Christ or you prayed that prayer to recommit your life, you're now in the family of God. But make sure you, how you know it is by obedience. Make sure you tell somebody. Tell your spouse, tell the friend you came with, or if you say, I came alone, then tell me, tell some of the worship team, tell Kevin, tell someone and say, hey, hold me accountable because I gave my life to Christ or I recommitted my life to Christ. But you need that. And hey, We'd love to have you be a part of this church. If you're visiting, be a part of the church. Or if you have a church home, go back to that church home. Just make sure it's a Philadelphia church teaching the word of God. Amen? So we're glad that you gave your life to Christ or recommitted and walk with him. Because how many know the day is short and he's coming back soon. Amen? Bless you guys. We love you. Let's stand and worship the Lord one last time with all our heart today.
Thank you guys. Have a great week.